Let's move on. So, I'm going to read you this. Uh, Christopher uh, posted this in the comments. This is from June 29th, 1989. Let's do some quick, quick math. 30 years ago. 31 years ago. UN predicts disaster if global warming not checked. 30 years ago, a senior UN environmental official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. Oops, missed it by that much. <clears throat> so we had a decade. Th three, three decades ago, we had one more decade. Rem remember two years ago, we had 12 years left to turn climate change around. But apparently three decades ago, we had 10 years left. Uh, coastal flooding and crop failures would create an exodus of eco-refugees, threatening political chaos, said Noel Brown, director of the New York office of the UN Environment Program. No, dear, um, uh, dear climate deniers, this doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening or, or that they said it was bad th three decades ago and look, we're still here and everything's fine. No, what's happening, what's happening right now, three decades later, is that we're enter entering a time. We're entering a time of global climate chaos. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to link something. I forgot to actually uh, get a link to something I wanted to show y'all. But anyways, uh, we are, you know, we're now entering an age of, of uh, increased storm activity, wildfire activity, uh, drought, we're, you know, we're seeing just extreme weather events constantly happening all over the planet. And, you know, we're seeing the, the lowest sea ice volume ever recorded. This We're going to set a record this year. We did set a record. Second lowest sea ice extent. Extent doesn't really matter. You know, if this ice is totally thin, it doesn't really matter. So we are down to, you know, rock bottom again on, on Arctic sea ice. Not not totally gone, but we're in, in danger of being totally without sea ice in the next, you know, two to five years. Um, easily. Easily. Uh, so here we are. We're sitting at the prep precipice of climate disaster, climate chaos, right? So that's what that means is that 30, th 30 years ago, three decades ago, we had 10 years to turn it around. And then that that insane lunatic George W. Bush stole the election from Al Gore and was placed into the, the position of presidency, the presidency, I, you know, not, I don't blame all of global warming on George W. Bush. That would be ridiculous. But if we had, you know, if Al Gore would have been elected or would have been president in the year 2000, we may, may, may have had a chance to really start the ball rolling on taking some action. Um, instead, it was pushed back a whole other eight years, and then Obama, you know, kind of did some knob turning for another eight years. So 16 years later, we got Trump, who, you know, is absolutely throwing out all, all illusions that anything will be done about climate change. So, you know, uh, 20 years later, <laughs> here we are. So that's what happened. And I was talking about that yesterday, right? See how quick 10 years goes by? Um, politically, oh, we're gonna do something by 2035. Uh, oh, we're you know we got this climate plan, but we're gonna still have fracking and we're still gonna subsidize fossil fuel industry. Um, you see how quickly inaction can hap can happen. How quickly uh, eight years or 12 years or 16 years can go by and still nothing is done. Even though you have you know people saying we're gonna do something, anyways. So for you, you climate deniers out there, that's what that means. If you didn't understand that, if you didn't get what I, what the, what the meaning of that is, um, if you think that the climate is everything is fine and, and nothing is wrong and everything's okay, even though we're we barely have any Arctic sea ice left and glaciers are melting at a, a record pace. Uh, sea, sea levels are rising. We're getting king tides in, in Hawaii, Miami, Louisiana, you know, New York, all over the country, California. 
right? Rise, the seas are rising. The Arctic is, is melting. Hurricanes are happening. Fl- you know, cities are getting flooded every single year, getting 500,000 year floods. This is called climate change happening right now. So that's what that means. We didn't take action when we should have. That's what that means. <clears throat> Osama number five, Ron Paul appeared to have a stroke just now on a, on a live interview. I'm, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope Ron Paul is okay. Um, anyways, just a moment, guys. I want to find something to show you. There's so much to show you. There's no way that we are knowing which way that we are going. Where are we? Let me see. I think we are. Sorry, guys. Just trying to trying to cue something up here. <clears throat> So this is from a Canadian prepper. Let's see if I can get this guy a little closer to us, okay? Okay. Um, so I, w- I want to show you just this uh, snippet of, of Canadian prepper video, latest one. Which, you know, really, really breaks it down. This is all n- things that we already know. We're, we'll file this under common knowledge, hopefully, by now. And we both know their track record on the environment. Now, the reason why all this is so important is because this year, the Arctic sea ice Hold was on. at a record low density. And the second... Hold on. ...society... By 2030, the gross domestic product of China is going to be twice that of the United States. India is going to be following closely in their footsteps, and we both know their track record on the environment. Now, the reason why all this is so important is because this year, the Arctic sea ice was at a record low density and the second lowest extent on record. Now, I'm going to talk about why that is so significant. I'm going to overlay some footage here of... Uh, how much sea ice has been lost over the last 40 years and it's absolutely staggering and when you understand what the implications of this actually are it's frightening to think what's going to happen when all of the sea ice is actually gone it's not going to be good we are going to see cataclysmic impacts around the planet when the sea ice dissipates and when it is finally gone the best climatologists in the world tell us that we're going to see a massive spike in temperature which is going to cause all sorts of problems increased uh, storms it's going to make it hot where it should be cold and cold where it should be hot increase wildfires and it's just going to make it even harder for us to grow food to support a growing population it's still a growing population we're at about 7.8 billion right now it's projected to go up to 10 billion within the next few decades and i don't really see it leveling off and even if it does the consumption is going to continue to increase as china and india have a middle class they're going to want to start to consume in the same way that we westerners consume so there is no end in sight in sight every country is going full steam ahead in terms of development and i'm not saying that we need to arrest development and i'm not necessarily throwing out any solutions in this video because there is no solution unless there is a global initiative to deal with the issue and that and yeah that about sums it up unless there is a global Initiative slash coronavirus lockdown type um, action by the powers that be and all the media, you know, letting people know this is why we're doing this. This is really a deal. This is a real thing. <laughs> Alexi Kuperin and I isn't here anymore, right? <clears throat> 
Andy the Gardener, Vin Diesel knows what he's talking about. Yes, he does look a little like Vin Diesel. <laughs> uh, that's funny. He interviewed Guy McPherson years ago. Yeah, well, he know. I mean, everything that he just said there was an echo of a Guy McPherson talk, right? So it's all the same information. We all know. But really good point there in saying that China and India are going to be growing exponentially as far as their um, their economies and their consumption. Consumption. He really made a good point there. It's not just about global warming or the heating of the planet. It's about the consumption that leads to the heating and the consumption that leads to, to the destruction. Um, so there's that. And again, when I said yesterday, and I, you know, I'm sorry if this, you know, really impinges on anybody's sensibilities, but, you know, a lot of people are going to perish, whether we, you know, whether we deal with climate change or not. I mean, we're already locked into a certain amount of catastrophe, so we're going to have to brace for that. We're going to have to accept that that's going to happen. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do th mitigate the damage. We absolutely should mitigate the damage. But right now, <clears throat> the way that it's happening, the way that global governments are acting, the way that corporations are acting, the way that uh, the media is acting, they don't care, right? Because they're leading us all to the slaughter. They are saying like, let's just keep on going. The economy must keep continue to grow. We must continue to consume. We must continue to do all the things that we do every day. And that is literally leading us to the slaughter because they're not letting us know, hey, guys, we're about to hit this wall and it's going to be really ugly. And people, a lot of people are going to be in a lot of pain, right? They're not getting anybody ready for that. They're getting ready. They're getting everybody ready to just smash into the wall, totally unannounced. Oh, what was that? <laughs> you know, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. So... You know, I'm saying that a lot of people are going to succumb to the effects of climate change. That's not me being mean. That's me actually pointing out the fact that the powers that be don't care. They're not letting you know this. They're not alerting you to this problem. That's the conspiracy theory, guys. Again, you know, all my denialist jokers out there, that's the conspiracy the conspiracy is not that it's a hoax. The conspiracy is they're trying to lot, not let you know that everyone is about to run into a brick wall head first, and they're just going to go ahead and let people go ahead. You know, they're going to let people do that. They're going to let that happen. They're going to let that happen while they all get in their escape pods and drop down 20, 20 stories under the surface of the earth into their bunkers, right? That's, that's what they're going to do. So... Um, yeah, so, you know, don't blame me. Don't shoot the messenger, uh, right? This is what happens. People get really mad at people for telling, you know, for revealing the truth. That's why they're, that's why Julian Assange is on trial. Hold on one second. I see that my Wi-Fi is trying to say, hey, I don't care about you. Okay. What, what seems to happen these days is like, oh, don't say, don't say scary stuff. Don't upset the apple cart. Don't talk about, you know, crazy, mean things. Or don't say that, you know, the, that the system we live in is going to collapse and, every, you know, people are going to ha have a hard time. Don't, you know, don't, don't let anybody know that. Don't say that kind of stuff. You're being mean. You're being, you know, divisive or you're being, you know, scary or whatever. But the fact that the powers that be are going are gonna to let people just walk into a situation of mass death without letting them know or alerting to that, you know, people really got to find that out on their own, right? People got to discover that truth for themselves. That is actually the crime, right? Let's not, let's not hold the people responsible accountable, Let's hold the tr the people that tell the truth. Let's hold them accountable. Let's the people pointing this out, the truth out. Let's hold you know, you know. Let's make them the bad people, just like Julian Assange, right? Julian Assange told told the truth about our war crimes. Oh my God! 
it's, it's not that we committed the war crimes. That's not the bad thing. Oh, it's the bad thing was letting people know that these war crimes happened. That was the bad thing. You understand how that works? G. Demer is truth bad, gaslighting good, indeed. I've been talking about forest dweller research. I'm talking about climate news. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm talking about news that we already know. Anyways, uh, here's a... Uh, Here's an interesting news story. Climate clock in Union Square counts down to deadline for action. So at first I thought somebody had, this was an, uh, like an official climate clock, but no. Um, it was some activists. A giant clock in New York City used to tell the time, but now it will tell you how much time the world has left to stop the devastating damage of climate change. Uh, this is interesting. In honor of Climate Week, a coalition of scientists and activists reset the digital clock with red numbers seen on the side of a building in Union Square and changed it into a climate clock. <clears throat> the numbers now count down the years, days, hours, minutes, and seconds the Earth has left to take action to stop global warming from going over 1.5C. That, I mean, that right so right there in itself is laughable on many levels, but you know, but they're trying, they're trying to do something. According to the organization who aims to put, put the countdown clock in cities across the world, the clock's calculation is based on the world's current rates of emission emissions and amount of CO2 that can still be released in the atmosphere. The clock simply counts down to when the carbon budget runs out. If the world manages to lower its emissions, more time will be left on the clock. So how much time do we have left? Are they going to tell us? Uh, did they actually say how much time we have left in this, in this report? I think it was like seven years or something. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. Maybe we can watch this video and somebody can tell us. Hold on. Yeah. To protect against climate change. Over the weekend, the clock was reset for Climate Week. Seven years, 101 days. Now you know. Now you know when when the the real time runs out. So, so sometime in 2027, I guess that's that's the end. I don't know. Uh, we have 121 watching. 58 likes. Please like up the video if you're new. Please subscribe. And you can always uh, watch my videos on Rockfin as well. Scott Andrews, the climate clock should be dis displaying negative numbers. Yes, I know. Andy the Gardener, what is the carbon budget for 3C warming? Have a guess. I, I know. I know. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Uh, forest dweller research. The corona lockdown is coming again. Yeah, it's definitely coming to Europe. Climate will warm like last time. Uh, G. Demers, my 15-year-old niece, says that her friends know that 2030 will not be good. The kids get it. Well, as, as well, they, they should. Alexi says you're gonna be you're gonna be 23 in seven years. Okay. Damn it. That's that is a that is young. Um. You're just a sprung chicken. Uh, let's see. Rich Diana says that's close to guys. I guess guys clock, but his is for extinction. Anyways, let's move on. Let's move on. Well, and uh, chalk one up for wild animals. Grizzly bear kills hunter in the first fatal mauling at America's biggest 
Park. And the crowd goes, yeah, Grizzly Bears. And for the human that, the, ma- the guy that got mauled, big old shrug on you. Big old shrug. That's, you know, I don't know. Be more careful or something. I don't know. Or maybe don't don't go out hunting. Um, or you know, be careful because there are bears out there. Natural selection and all. A gra- grizzly bear mauled and killed a hunter in an Alaskan national park on Sunday. The National Park Service confirmed the first known mauling fatality in the park's forty-year year history. Uh, according to an NPS statement on Tuesday, the hunter was out exploring Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve as part of a 10-day moose with a friend. While well, he was hunting, he was he was hunting mooses. Um, so federal wildlife authorities urge hunters and ever, anyone else exploring this kind of backcountry to be bear aware. Uh, scientists have found that drought and other climate change effects are altering how grizzly bears eat in Alaska. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, I'm, you know, look, I'm very sad that somebody passed away. That really sucks. He got killed. I'm not cheering on people getting killed. Uh, however, you know, that is called the wild, wilding back. But, you know, if you're out hunting moose in this day and age, in, in the, in the age of climate change and the age of destroying uh, nature hand over fist, you should know that you are on the wrong side of history. <laughs> and if you get on the wrong side of the, of a bear, uh, you know, people are going to be like, well, you know, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Osama, I saw, somebody said something about that. There's a kid protesting climate change on an ice flow. Is that is that real? Hold on. <clears throat> uh <laughs> It looks like there are no matches for your search. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. All right, well, let's cover this. <laughs> Since we're here. A British teenager staged a sit-in on an Arctic ice flow to protest climate change. This is from today. A Brit- British teenager has staged a protest against climate change. Inside the Arctic Circle, in the world's most northerly climate strike, Maya Rose Craig, a passionate ornithologist and a nature climate and equal rights campaigner was photographed protesting on an ice flow at the Arctic ice edge north of Svalbard at 82.2 north earlier this week. The 18-year-old who lives near the southwestern English city of Bristol held up a placard saying, you strike for climate. She spent five hours on the ice, a spokesperson for the environmental organization Greenpeace told CNN. Craig, who says on her Twitter page that she is the youngest person to have seen half the world's birds, arrived in the Arctic on board the Greenpeace ship Arctic Sunrise as part of an expedition documenting the impact of the climate crisis and investigating marine life in the region. Wow. Uh, Wow. Okay. Do we have any footage for that? I guess not. I don't know. <clears throat> wow. 
Okay. Well, somebody's out there doing doing something. Poppy Davis, good for her, right? Let's move on. Let's keep it going. Uh, I need. I don't. I'm running out of time, and I, I'm not nowhere close to being done. Uh, this is from yesterday. Nearly 400 whales are dead in mass stranding off coast of Australia. Nearly 400 pilot whales have died after they become stranded off the coast of Australia. The whales began piling up off of Macquarie Harbor on Tasmania's west coast. Earlier this week, according to the Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Service, while marine biologists initially believe about 270 whales have been stranded in three different locations, a fourth location containing an additional 200 whales was found about six miles into the harbor at Fraser Flats. Practically all of those whales were found dead. About 30 at the location remain alive, marine biologists determined. Uh, on Wednesday, rescue crews continued their attempt to save the whales by refloating them, according to the Wildlife Service. So far, about 50 have been saved. That's a success, and we will continue to try and free as many of the remaining alive animals as we can, said Nick Dika, Wildlife Regional Man Manager for the Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, so I'm going to finish up with... Poppy Davis, too much doom, so little time indeed. So much doom, so little time. Uh, okay, lastly, I'm going to cover some techno utopia or whatever you want to call it. Uh, tech fixes are us. This, some of the wild plans that people are going to start cooking up in order to save ourselves from climate change. Will they be too late? Tune into the next episode of It's Your Ass. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I, I kind of like that title. Um, the daring plan to save the Arctic ice with glass. Oh, boy. Um, can this be an, a good idea? Can this be a completely insane idea? Let's, let's read on. The fear that action to combat climate change has been too slow has led some scientists to test unconventional methods to stem the loss of Arctic sea ice. One of the most important yet underappreciated features of the Arctic sea ice is the ability of its blindingly white surfaces to reflect sunlight, otherwise known as albedo. In, in the UK, albedo, in the UK, albedo, in the US, for at least as long as our species has existed, the frozen seas at the top of the world have acted as a massive parasol. It keep, helps keep the planet cool and its climate stable. And if we, if we were watching a little bit earlier, that parasol is almost gone, gone, gone. Uh, yet now much of that ice is rapidly vanishing. Rising temperatures have locked the Arctic in its self-destructive feedback loop. The warmer it gets, the reflective white ice dissolves into darker blue water, uh, which absorbs more of the sun's warmth rather than reflecting it back into space. Warmer water accelerates melting, which means yet more absorption of heat. We all know the story, which drives for, for the melting, blah, 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 blah. That's called a feedback loop. This July, ice cover was as low as it had ever been at that time of year. As planet warming greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, some have been driven to explore desperate measures. Desperate measures. One proposal put forward by the California-based nonprofit Arctic Ice Project, uh, a perfectly benign name, appears as daring as it is bizarre. To scatter a thin layer <laughs> of reflective glass powder over, the part, over parts of the Arctic in an effort to protect it from the sun's rays and help ice grow back. All right. What do you say, guys? Insane or just slightly insane? 
We're trying to break that feedback loop and start rebuilding, says engineer Leslie Field, an adjunct lecturer at Stanford University and chief technical officer of the organization. Well, we've already heard of, of uh, dispersing ground rock over the desert. And now we're talking about dispersing ground glass. Uh, the melting of the sea ice has impacts far beyond the Arctic and its inhabitants. It will contribute to rising sea levels, and some say it's already disrupting weather patterns around the globe. Some say. Some say, the people that understand that it is already disrupting weather patterns around the globe. If we lose our protective white shield entirely, which we pretty much lost the, the protective white shield entirely, like it's already done. It's already a done deal, right? If we lose... It's just bizarre how these people talk, as if this, this is something that's happening in the future. It is already done. <laughs> you, you lunatics, it is done. We already lost our protective white shield. Not entirely, but, you know, extensively. Which some would reckon could happen just decades from now. Guys, 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 are you living in reality? I just showed you a graph on this, you know, we just saw a graph on this channel that showed most of the sea ice practically gone, but they're talking about it happening decades from now. Shut the front door. It could have, it could have the same warming effects as another 25 years of fossil fuel emissions at current rates, which would mean more intense droughts, flooding, and heat waves. So this is, you know, I'm going to stop right here just for a moment. Part of the problem is that these people talking about the problem and studying the problem and coming up with a solution to the problem aren't even operating in reality. Holy shnikes. They're not even operating in reality. The reality that it's now, <laughs> it is here. Um, we don't have decades. What are they talking about saving? They should have done this 30 years ago or 20 years ago. I, I'm just, I'm just flabbergasted by the amount of just flat out denial of, of, of the, of reality from people that supposedly believe in climate change. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, let me see. Anyways, by rebuilding sea ice <laughs> that is already gone, Field hopes her approach will also restore its ancient function as a planetary air conditioner and help counteract the effects of global warming. All right, guys, you're really, really late. Can I just tell you that? Can I just tell you that, how late you are? This is from September 23rd, 2020. This is from two days ago. Did anybody look at the ice charts before they even put out this article? You lunatics. Uh, anyways, many scientists frown upon such frown upon such such technological interventions in Earth's planetary system, known broadly as geoengineering, arguing that fiddling with nature might cause further damage. Well, uh, yeah, and then there's that. <laughs> However, the utter lack of progress on climate mitigation is really opening up a space, a lane, if you will, for all of these geoengineering things to be discussed. Um. Yeah. Yeah. This is Emily Cox, who studies climate policy and public attitudes towards geoengineering at the University of Cardiff. Emily Cox, are you operating in reality? That said, the urgency does not er erase the uncertainty. What, what, do, uh, what do you do if something goes wrong? <laughs> well, it's already gone pretty wrong. I guess that's the excuse they're going to use for just doing whatever they need to do, right? Well, it's already gone pretty wrong, especially in the Arctic, which is already a fairly fragile ecosystem. Ooh. Uh, Field launched the Arctic Ice Project, formerly known as ICE 911 <laughs> or 911, in 2008. 2008, we're talking about 12 years ago. 12 years ago. And now they're, they're still talking about, well, we're considering doing this. What are they, what is going on? Soon after watching the climate change documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, which convinced her of the urgency of doing something about the melting sea ice, so urgent that 12 years later, they're not even doing it yet. They're not even doing anything yet. Anyways, 
In particular, it's the fate of old, thick sea ice that worries her the most. You mean the old, thick sea ice that's gone already, you idiot? Oh, my God. I, I don't know if I can read any more of this. I just... Is she looking at ice uh, charts from this year? Is this person? What is this article even? What is the purpose of this article? Other than, other than to make people think that we still have some time, is my guess. That, that you're going to convince people that we still have a couple of decades. Because I, I guess if you do, didn't know anything about climate change at all, you could read this and go like, huh, well, that's really interesting. Well, yeah, you know, that's, that's going to be bad in a couple of decades. Well, I hope they get this uh, glass on the sea ice project going really quickly. You know, and I, you know I, hope it, I hope they get this going. I mean, the gosh. Yet over the past 33 years, that ice has dwindled by a staggering 95%. <laughs> they just said it. They just said it, 95%. Well, almost really, really close to 100%. So basically, it's gone. It's gone. Uh, what if, Field asked, she could layer a reflective material on top of the young ice to protect it during the summer months? If it had that extra protection, could it rebuild into sturdy multi-year ice and kickstart a local process of ice regrowth? She settled on silica, or silicon dioxide, which occurs naturally in most sand and is often used to make glass as the material of choice. She found a manufacturer that turns it into tiny, brightly reflective beads, each one 65 micrometers in diameter, thinner than a human hair, but too large for them to be inhaled and cause lung problems. Field says the beads are also hollow inside, so they'll float on water and continue to reflect away sunlight even if the ice begins to melt. Over the past decade, she and her, she and her team have scattered the silica spheres over several lakes and ponds in Canada and the United States so far with encouraging res results. Well, okay. I guess that's good. I don't know. For instance, in a pond in Minnesota, just a few layers of glass powder made young ice 20% more reflective enough to delay the melting of the ice. But by spring, oh, by spring, when the ice is in an uncovered area, in an uncovered area of the pond had completely, when the ice in an uncovered area of the pond had completely vanished, there was still nearly a foot of ice in the section treated with glass beads okay well that's promising field doesn't want to carpet the arctic in ice and glass instead she plans on distributing it strategically to protect some particularly fast melting vulnerable areas like fram strait a thin passage between greenland and svalbard according to results of a climate model she presented last december at the annual meeting of american geophysical union Treating the Fram Strait could lead to large-scale ice regrowth across parts of the Arctic. <clears throat> okay. Scientists agree that the beads are well-intentioned, but worried about their potential effects on the Arctic ecosystem. If they float around there indefinitely, it's just going to clog up the ocean and mess with the ecosystem, says Cecilia Bitz, an atmospheric scientist at the University of Washington who specializes in Arctic sea ice. Huh. Some biologists are concerned about the potential effects on creatures at the base of the Arctic food chain. Depending on how much light the silica beads reflect, they could block sunlight from photosynthesizing plankton, such as diatoms, algae that live under the sea ice and around it. Any change in plankton abundance could cascade upon the food web and have unpredictable effects on organisms from fish to seals and polar bears, notes Karina Geisbrecht. An ocean uh, chemist and ecologist at Canada, Canada's University of Victoria who has studied the role of silica in Arctic ecosystems. <clears throat> um, some view such approaches as stopgap solutions to climate change in that they only treat single symptoms. On top of that, the silica balls are similar in size to diatoms, which are eaten by zooplankton, known as copepods or sopopods. Geisbrecht notes, if the beads sank into the water column, so copepods uh, might consume them thinking they are diatoms. Without gaining any nutrition, in the worst case, the copepods could starve with knock-on effects for other members of the Arctic ecosystems. <clears throat> um, 
So far, Field has been using beads that mostly stay afloat, though some inevitably sink each season, and she is planning to test the impact on plankton ecosystems. If there are any harmful effects, she'll explore ways of tailoring the beads to make them ecologically safer. Okay. Well, um, I don't know. What say you guys? What say you? Um, are these... It's probably a bad idea. <laughs> uh, it's literally plastic. Yes, Alexi, yes. Basil, solutions are becoming the problem. Yes. Uh, Keith Hayes, bingo, mass extinctions of filter feeders. Oh, Osama says silica is not plastic. It's like sand, right? Naturally occurring. I don't know. Kuro hikes. Dude, let's just pour glass all over the world's beaches. <laughs> right? And stuff like that. I agree. This is rather insane. Any of the gardener, these people are insane. Yes. Hey guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel with the links below, uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so hopefully I will see you over there, and thanks so much.